Ladies and gentlemen, we'll get started now. Um, I'm Andrew Gilbert, the Director of the Air Power Development Centre, and it's my great pl pleasure to uh, introduce Ross Mahoney. Uh, he was the RAF historian, and he did his um, PhD through University of Birmingham. My first contact with him was as a student on his inaugural uh, massive open online course called From World War to White Hot, and I believe it's still available on Future Learn if you want to do it. And he's also been an avid supporter of the Rollins Air Power Seminar Series, the next one of which is on the 17th of October, and you can register online. Um, his introduction and his bio is in the handout that you've been given. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Mahoney. Just to be clear, just before um, colleagues back in the UK watch this and go, he was the RAF historian. I was the historian at the Royal Air Force Museum. Um, slightly different, probably meant I got to say different things to different people. Um, but first, uh, I just want to thank Andrew and the team at the Air Power Development Centre for the invite to come and talk to you today. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm not from around these parts. Um, and as such, um, my view should probably come with somewhat of a health warning I may end up saying things that people don't like. Uh, I tend to do that. I promise any strategists in the room there were none harmed in the production of this lecture. Um, if it makes you uncomfortable, uh, then I'm sorry, I'm probably doing something right. These are very much my own views uh, of someone looking from the outside in, um, rather than someone who's currently working within, for example, the PME ecosystem. Um, I even accept that they, they might be wrong. I'd also like to thank the now pilot officer Christy Adams and Wing Commander Trav Halen uh, because it was a discussion by them uh, about a month to six weeks ago um, that got me here today. Um, they were discussing a chapter in a recent book published um, by the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies um, at the USAF um, School um, and a chapter by Richard Muller on the air power historian and the education of strategists uh, and they thought, oh, can we get someone to talk about that? and Trav in his own inimitable way went, Ross can do it, so hence I'm here today. Um, I'd also like to stress that as with the writing of official histories, um, this paper represents my first thoughts on the subject rather than the last. So um, what is history? What's its relevance to the air power strategists? These are clearly quite important questions. However, as Richard Muller, a senior member of the faculty at the USAF School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, reflected in 2016, and I quote, As a rule, air forces have not embraced historical study to the same extent as have their army or navy counterparts. This is a compelling argument, and while in general I would agree with Muller, it should be reflected that some of the issues he identified also affect armies and navies. Indeed, more generally, it's, um, I'm a little bit more sceptical and not convinced that until very recently any of the services did historical study very well in the Western world. Nonetheless, Muller also suggested that there were four reasons why airmen should study history. These were first, to instill a corporate spirit. Second, to il illustrate or even, and I quote, legitimise ideas. Thirdly, to search for lessons. And finally, to use history as a means, as an ability to think critically. These are ideas that I will touch on during the course of my talk today. However, as you can see on the slide, um, I'm going to start with a quote from a naval historian. Don't throw me out of the room just yet. In 1912, a year after Italy had dropped the first bomb over Libya using an aeroplane, US naval historian and strategist A.T. Mahan reflected on the link between the study of military history and sound military conclusions. Mahan also reflected that no two battles were alike. In writing these lines, Mahan saw the utility of history as providing principles from which strategy could be derived. And it's important to note that the article in which these words appeared was focused on the work of the US Naval War College, of which Mahan was president during the late 19th century. Importantly, however, in making clear that no two battles were alike, Mahan was also highlighting that the study of history does not provide clear lessons for the military. Nonetheless, the study of history can offer a lens through which current air forces can reflect on the challenges they face. And in this lecture, uh, I'm going to discuss several related themes concerning the relationship between the study of history and 
quote, the education of air power strategists. And there are reasons why I've just put those in quote marks. Um, however, before starting, it's worth me making the admission that I view myself as an applied military historian. And it's a term that requires some clarification. Broadly speaking, I accept that the study of history has a utility to the present. While history clearly does not repeat itself, there are indeed examples that provide essential context for contemporary discussions. I would also just like to make, sure, make clear that I am no strategist. Um, I'll leave that to people with a higher grade pay than I. However, given this admission, this lecture covers two critical iterated themes. The first theme is the development of air power history as a subfield of military history and some of its associated challenges. As part of this, I will reflect on history as a discipline and some of the politics associated with the field of military history. Indeed, if we are to use history as a tool for educating strategists, we need to be aware of the challenges associated with the discipline to make the best use of the field. The second theme of this lecture considers the role, of, role history has played and can play in the education of air power strategists. Firstly, I'll broadly describe how some air forces, and I use the Royal Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force as my examples, have used history as a tool for learning. And then I'll reflect on how history can be used to educate strategy, strategists in the continuing challenge to achieve professional mastery in air forces. But before I go any further, it's worth defining some parameters of my discussion. Uh, firstly, when I refer to education, I'm stressing that done in both formal and informal situations both inside and outside of the classroom. I would argue that military professionals seeking to take ownership of their development will, in my opinion, continue to attempt to understand the profession of arms outside of, the, outside of formal settings of, for example, staff college. And secondly, when I refer to strategists, I'm using the term in a broad collegiate sense of the word. Indeed, if we live and operate in the age of the so-called strategic corporal, then it follows that we might also exist in the period when we are all strategists. So, what is history? Uh, as the British historian John Tosh reflected, the term history is ambiguous at best, certainly in the English language. Is history either a collection of facts related to what has happened, or is it the scholarly discussion and representation of the past? Accepting the latter is correct, it follows that the interpretation of the past is an argument without end. While a hackneyed observation, history is not a stagnant field, but rather a dynamic one where historians continually re-examine evidence and reinterpret the past. This reinterpretation is challenging in part because there are issues concerning the extent of historical evidence available to historians and by default strategists who seek to apply lessons from the past to the present. The archival record and evidence that underpins the interpretation of the past are incomplete, often a point, um, often a point for, uh, forgotten. For example, the National Archives of, of Australia only ever preserves a certain amount of material generated by the Australian government. Added to the issue of what constitutes the archival record and what sources historians use to com and what sources historians use to complement such materials is the perennial question of access. Unless you're an official historian, um, it's you, you struggle to access material produced recently. On the issue uh, on the first issue of the archival record, historians make use of a plurality of sources um, from a number of areas to try and corroborate their arguments. For example, if I were writing on the evolution of British air power thinking, I would make use of both official and unofficial statements, such as doctrine manuals and articles written in a variety of outputs, such as journals. Added to this, I would seek to examine the archival record concerning how the Air Ministry constructed statements on British air power thinking. That can be quite pro problematic because air forces have tended not to preserve the material that deals with the issue of who wrote what, when, and how. So you have to look at a number of different sources to come up with your view. On the second issue, most operational material is by its very character sensitive at the time of creation, and as such, access to such sources uh, tends to be limited and is governed by certain rules that often mean they're classified for a period. And of course, some material is never released. This can be, to say the least, problematic. Gradually, however, governments have um, opened up and access, for example, to archival material in the UK is now governed by a 20-year rule. These are just some of the practical challenges that confront the historian in the pursuit of their craft. However, there are some clear politics um, with regards to the study of military history. 
Uh, and the field, of the, military, the field of military history can broadly be split into three subfields, popular, academic, and applied. I can deal with popular military history quite quickly and broadly consists of your toffee, cake, toffee? coffee table books with lots of pretty pictures and work by popular historians whose names I shall not mutter here. Regarding air power, we can broadly categorise them as quote, the Airfix School of History, with many works focusing on technology used by air forces and those overwhelmingly concentrated on operations. We can also add in memoirs, autobiographies and biographies, even though there are some excellent academic biographies on airmen uh, in existence. Acad academic military history broadly can be viewed as the study of the past for its own intellectual sake, and one that seeks to uphold the scholarly standards associated with other academic endeavours through mechanisms such as peer review. Applied military history is a field that aims to have a utility for a variety of end users. Broadly speaking, these end users are the military, but can be split into several stakeholders such as educational training establishments, doctrine cells, and policy makers seeking context decision to decision making processes. Today, it's the latter two subfields of military history that concerns us most, as there is a degree of overlap between them given the increasing civilianization of the PME ecosystem over the past 20 years or so. Increasingly academically trained historians are involved in the provision of guidance in a variety of forms to the military audience. For example, in the 1990s, the RAF created the CAS Air Power Workshop that consisted of key players, including civilian academic historians, that led to the publication of several volumes that can be broadly considered informal doctrine. The critical criticism of applied military history is that it's a form of weaponizing the past for the present. This has recently become noticeable in discussions surrounding so-called minimum force doctrines used historically in the British Empire and the lessons learned and then, um, and then applied to modern counterinsurgency warfare. Underpinning this criticism is a view that those writing applied military history do so shorn of context and understanding in seeking to deduce lessons learned. By some, this form of military history is being described as a form of parochialism. Unfortunately, currently, a key target for this criticism are academic historians working in PME institutions where history is used as a means to illuminate and provide context to the ambiguous challenges that officers might confront in the future. Indeed, perhaps one of the reasons why such criticisms have emerged against academic military historians is because the subfield of military history is one that was, to quote, may actually be of some use rather than being just some abstract discipline. Moreover, as Joe Goody and David Armitage suggested in their, t uh, in their call to arms, the History Manifesto, military history remains one of the last outposts, outposts of long-term history in a short-term world. The essential context for Gordy and Armitage, Armitage's work is an argument for the use of long-term history as part of public discourse while reconnecting short-term micro-histories to their larger narrative framework. This idea of a long-term history of air power is vital for the education of strategists. For example, in a 2008 article in the RAF's Air Power Review, Group Captain Ian Shields, then Assistant Director Air and Space at the Defence Concepts and Doctrine <coughs> Centre, suggested four reasons why it's possible that perhaps we might not have yet produced a true air power strategist in the sense of Clausewitz or Jomini or Mahan or Corbyn. Shields' reasons were the age of air power, its military origins, technology and the uniquely joint nature of the air domain. Importantly for today's discussion, Shields argued that a lack of history may in part explain the inability so far for air power thinkers to discern the same enduring themes that together spell out the art of air power. As such, good long-term histories of air power are vital to help provide the means to understand the uniqueness of the air domain and bridge the gap between theory and strategy. Air Vice Marshal Tony Mason's Air Power Centennial Appraisal is an example of a good long-term history of air power uh, while similarly, Colin Gray's work on air power strategy, Air Power for Strategic Effect, provides a useful overview of a strategic history of air power. Indeed, as Gray himself has written in a recent work on what the US Army should learn from history, today is only tomorrow's yesterday. However, such long-term histories must connect with scholarly micro-histories that allow for the construction of larger narratives shorn of myth. To do this, there is a need to accept that air power and its history is much more than just about aircraft, weapon systems and bombing. 
Indeed, as John Andreas Olsen has recently reflected, air power is also about training, education, values, rules of engagement, leadership, adaptability, boldness in execution, and a range of other factors, tangible and non-tangible, that influence a military operation. Indeed, works on such themes will allow historians and strategists alike to understand the challenge of continuity and change. Historically, however, the criticism of weaponising the past does have some weight, and air power strategies are not above being criticised for the poor use of applying history to support their arguments. Indeed, as Sir Michael Howard noted in his uh, notable 1961 lecture on the use and abuse of military history, when the great interwar pioneers of air war advocated striking at the homeland and at the morale of the enemy people, they were basing their conclusions on their interpretation of the past war. And I'll come back to that point of their in a moment. More recently, Colonel John Warden's The Air Campaign has been criticised for how he, select, uh, he used a selective read of history to fit his theory. Similarly, while more of an airman who was a general strategist rather than an air power thinker per se, though his ideas do have applicability to the air domain, Colonel John Boyd's work cherry-picked history to provide illustrations and empirical validations for patterns he observed in combat. Admittedly, neither Warden nor Boyd are or were historians. However, such selective use of history by strategists become pro becomes problematic when such texts appear, for example, on Staff College reading lists, where they can reinforce the proclivities of those officers they are meant to educate. This criticism is not designed to denude the value of these officers' contribution to the development of strategic thought, but rather to context contextualise the challenge of applying history to the field of strategy. Indeed, the key importance of Warden's written work and Boyd's oral presentations are that they developed, conceptualised communi and communicated critical ideas to a new generation of personnel in a period that, with regards to, with regards to air power, was perhaps one ca characterised as a lacuna of strategic thinking. However, the sele selective use of history was, be was being used to validate, uh, uh, validate ideas, and as at least one retired senior British Army officer has noted, a little, a little military history may be more dangerous than none at all. It should also be noted that this, cri this criticism is not specific to Boyd or Bo uh, Warden or Boyd, but one that can be applied to many other strategies. Arguably, this is one area where the good teaching of history and its associated critical thinking skills can be of utility to help develop useful powers of discrimination when reading such works. Despite this criticism, many air power thinkers have recognised the value of a broad reading of history. For example, in a 1921 article on strategy and air strategy, Group Captain John Shami of the Royal Air Force reflected on the challenge of deducing appropriate principles for the use of air power, given the brief history of air warfare to date. Nevertheless, importantly, Shami argued that strategic principles are derived from the study of history, and he recognised that examples from naval and military strategy could provide the necessary framework for a discussion of air strategy. In many respects, certainly from the British perspective, the development of strategic principles from the past in the interwar period also reflected a shared strategic culture where debates saw the emergence of a common language between the services. While Shields' lament about the question of where all the, all the air power strategies might, strategies might be might seem appropriate to today's discussion, I turn that question on its head and ask, where are all the air power historians? Indeed, if history is to be used to help strategists, then we require a well-defined corporate body of historians to produce writings to be used. Air power historians are a small group within a much larger subfield, but added to that context is the fact that we've been subjected to some very bad history. For example, and coming back to my earlier comment about the need for good long-term histories, Colin Gray reflected on Martin Van Crevelt's The Age of Air Power that, to quote, it is sadly ironic that Van Crevelt, a gifted historian, can know so much about air power, past and present, yet advance an argument so likely to mislead. In short, Van Crevelt's argument is that we've seen the rise and fall of independent air power, something with which a number of academics have disagreed. Added to the problem of poor history is the evolution of the subfield of air power history from the First World War to the present. Indeed, it's probably indicative of the state of the field that, that in his contribution to the 2006 edited volume, The Pastor's Prologue, which looked at the importance of uh, history to the military profession, 
Michael Howard differentiated between military and naval history, but did not discuss air power as a field in its own of its own. This suggests that air power history is merely part of a subfield of military history. Broadly speaking, however, as with any field of historical endeavour, writing on air power has gone through the cycle of the writing of early histories, revisionism and post-revisionism. For example, and coming back to my comment uh, about sources earlier, until the opening of the collection known as Air One at the National Archives in the UK, writing on the First World War in the air relied heavily on Sir Walter Raleigh and H.A. Jones's official history. Air One is actually the curated file set that contains the material that was used to write the RAF's official history of the First World War. Added to this problem, though I think he overstates his case, Noble Franklin, who co-wrote the official history of the strategic air offensive against Germany, um, argued that Raleigh and Jones's work reflected the prevailing strategy and doctrine prevalent with the air staff of the time. Thus, suggesting that as much as history has a role in educating strategists, the inverse might be true. Also, putting aside the debate of whether the air staff influenced the writing of the official history... Apologies, that's my phone. Such works ended um, key works such as the official history ended up on key reading lists, notably at the Staff College at Andover. Moreover, AP 125, a short history of the Royal Air Force, which was prepared by the Air Historical Branch, was derived from the official history and developed to meet the demand for a conci concise history for the RAF Cadet College at Cranwell. In this way, such a history was being used to instill a corporate spirit and develop an air mindedness in the RAF's officer class. While academic historians might bulk at this aspect of the use of history, it's often a necessary starting point and a challenge Air Forces face to this day. Most notably, how do you develop um, a necessary degree of knowledge about the history and ideas underpinning the profession of arms? Into this mix with the interwar air power strategists who use history to inform current debates. Here we have a problem of nuance. Such thinkers clearly had a historical mind, but their writings sought to extrapolate theories based on a limited amount of historical data with regards to the employment of air power. Indeed, many have suggested that the likes of Julio Due rejected history. And, um, and this is arguably why, on the previous slide, I underlined there in Howard's quote. Because many of these um, strategies sought to apply history but did so in a subjective manner and suffered from what we might describe as cultural blindness where they brought their, their own objectivity into question. For example, it's clear in analysing the impact of bombing in the First World War, British air power thinkers overestimated the effect air power would have on the morale of civilian populations. More recently, however, as Richard Overy has observed, the study of air power has increasingly become more respectable. Indeed, Overy himself was one of the first to write on air power history, respectively, with the publication of his notable work, The Air War, which was published back in 1980. Several factors have, have in part driven the increasing respectability of air power history. The first has been the opening up of archives that have allowed for the scholarly re-examination of events. Second, the so-called field of new military history has begun to have an impact on the analysis of air power, though we still lag somewhat behind the other subfields of military history. Writing on air power is now no longer simply about operation, strategy and policy, but is slowly incorporating studies into the sociological and cultural makeup of the forces responsible for applying air power. Third, we've seen an increasing civilianisation of the subfield in the past couple of decades. Finally, increasingly from the end of the Vietnam War, and putting aside the writing of official histories, Western Air Forces have increasingly taken the academic study of air power and its history more seriously, with some caveats. For example, the establishment of the posts such as the RAF's Director of Defence Studies in 1977 and the development of APDC here in Australia from 1979 onwards uh, marked important um, turning points. While these later examples are focused more on the study of air power as a form of national power, they never let, nevertheless have st the study of history as, as an aspect of their role. Indeed, in the UK, the Director of Defence Studies manages the CASIS Fellowship Scheme, which includes, for example, officers undertaking doctoral studies that include the study of history. The fellowships are designed to generate focused research papers on air power-related topics and develop the intellectual capital of the RAF, thus seeing a link between the use of history and contemporary discussions. However, while the state of air power history might have improved somewhat and continues to evolve, 
it can suggest that right now we exist in a period of intellectual poverty outside the framework of academics working within the PME ecosystem. What I'm suggesting here is that where are the air power historians working at civilian, uh, civilian universities? This, I would argue, is particularly prevalent here in Australia, and it's important to stress that I'm differentiating between air power and aviation history more broadly. Is the subject considered respectable enough to be treated alongside other subjects? Open-ended question, discuss. Added to this problem is that which was identified by John Ferris 20 years ago when he noted that those studying, those studying air power, either as children of airmen, have been military personnel themselves, and have been, have, have been employed at a historical office or a service school in Canada, Germany, the United Kingdom, uh, or the United States. And we can obviously add Australia to that, um, that field. Indeed, if I take myself as an example, uh, my PhD supervisor was a retired RAF one star. Um, I ended up working at the Royal Air Force Museum. I clearly have that relationship with uh, the military itself. Indeed, as Ferris further reflected, Scholars of air power are trained in few places and employed at few more. How much has this changed? This is also a question we might apply to air power strategists. Do strategists, for example, have to be in or at least have served in uniform? What is, what is the requirement for being a historian or a strategist? Indeed, going back to the quote for, uh, that I, I gave from Howard's um, 1961 lecture, uh, which came in the discussion section, one of the questions given by an army officer was, you know, how can you write military history if you've not served in uniform? Well, do I need to have served in uniform to be a good historian? I don't think so. So, coming on to air power, uh, coming on to history and air power education. Uh, while history and its application by air, uh, air forces is full of challenges, its use as a didactic tool for the military should not be under underestimated. Indeed, the study of history has been and remains an element of the curricula at Air Force educational establishments. However, the study of history has been unbalanced. And here I want to highlight two examples of good and bad practices. And again, um, in the, uh, two good and bad practices in the use of history as an educational tool for officers. Ironically, I recognise that what I'm about to say is, uh, is actually cherry-picking from history. And of course, the metric of good and bad is clearly highly objective. Uh, the picture you can see here is the, uh, the, the first course at the RAF Staff College in 1922. That's Brooke Popham, um, the first commandant, sitting with his dog. Uh, and in that picture you will see notable future senior officers, such as the future, future Chief of the Air Staff, Sir Charles Portal, um, Sholto Douglas, Keith Park, Kingston McClockery, uh, Drummond, uh, and including also some of the directing staff, including uh, Wilfred Freeman. And nevertheless, while the metric of good and bad is obviously selective, um, I do think these examples highlight the importance of recognising the value of education, the value of history as an educational tool. How it might be applied is a slightly different matter. At the RAF Staff College at Andover, the use of history, despite some of the issues I've already highlighted, was valued. In a 1921 article in the Army Quarterly, the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Marshal Sir Hugh Trenchard, noted that, to quote, we cannot entirely learn from naval and military. Uh, noted that while we cannot entirely learn from naval and military history, he did stress that the emergence of air power meant that the old principles of warfare must be studied. This was so that so that it could be considered how air power had affected the character of war. In this case, we can think about this as a case of continuity and change. How much did the emergence of air power change warfare? Here Trenchard highlighted the importance of, of uh, staff college as a vehicle for deducing strategic ideas. However, we must be clear that when the phrase the cradle of the RAF's brain was used at the opening of the staff college in 1922, it was done so in a broad strategic manner rather than as a direct reference to doctrine. Indeed, in many respects, the idea was the furtherance, furtherance of the value of the Air Force spirit that formed the cornerstone of RAF culture in this period. Moreover, it must also be reflected that the Staff College in this per period faced the perennial challenge of not only developing officers well-versed in the knowledge underpinning their profession, but also well-trained in staff duties. The first Commandant of Andover, Air Vice Marshal Robert Brooke Popham, argued that gra um, graduates should be able to think and act quickly and to change attitude of mind. And indeed, to paraphrase Michael Howard's hackneyed quote concerning the appropriateness of doctrine to future conflict, 
The importance of Andover was not that it got everything correct, but it, that it gave officers who attended Staff College the ability to get it right when it mattered. The study of history played an essential role in that process, and at Andover, the study of the past was used in two ways. It was used as a means of instruction, which arguably built on Brooke Poppins' experience at the Army Staff College at Camberley, and as a process of reflection. As Brooke Popper suggested in his opening lecture to students attending the fourth course at Andover in, from 1925 to 1926, to quote, I feel it unnecessary for me to enlarge upon the value of studying the history of war. This was because it appeared as if the importance of history was self-apparent to his audience. However, Brooke Popham also stressed that it was not, not enough to simply study the First World War, because, to quote, all wars differ and none present all the aspects of the whole problem. And indeed, if one looks at the curricula at the RAF Staff College at Andover, we do see lectures on 19th century warfare taking up, quite, uh, taking up a degree of time. At an, in, at an instructional level, the historical contents of lectures did change over time during the interwar years. However, importantly, it remained an aspect of the curricula. The use of history as a means of self-reflection requires some comment. Students at Andover were required to write an account of their service experience. For those on early courses, this experience primarily consisted of reflecting on their service during the First World War, though later on this would come to include operations in the 1920s. The aim of these essays was to develop an organisational repository of knowledge so that the lessons regarding the employment of air forces in war shall not be lost sight of. As well as being placed in the Staff College Library, selected essays were published in Air Publications and The Hawk, Andover's Journal. As Flight Lieutenant Meredith Thomas reflected in his, his 1923 essay, and I quote, Each day in actual war provided a new lesson or served to impress the importance of observing the earlier ones learned. While clearly an attempt to consider the impact of one's own experience on their development as officers, the RAF obviously viewed it as important to record these, ex the ex these experiences as a means of contributing both to the development of the Air Force as well as the ideas underpinning its employment. However, Brooke Popham recognised that such reflection, while valuable, could be dangerous as they led officers to look down the silo rather than up and beyond their own personal experiences. In Australia, however, the use of history as a didactic tool for education has a somewhat more troubled, um, uh, troubled history. For example, in the late 1940s and 1950s, history and related subjects featured little, little on the curriculum at the newly created RAAF College. As Alan Stevens has noted, the RAAF of this period identified itself as a narrow technocracy, with knowledge of the Air Force's core business to be, to be deduced from its technical components rather than a study of its history and ideas. In part, the relationship between history and air power education in the RAAF has been a reflection in the Air Force's small size and its reliance in this period heavily on the RAF and the, and the Australian Army for the provision of initial officer training and staff education. Regarding initial officer training in the two years, the RWF was affected by its use of the Royal Military College at Duntroon. Here, instruction in air power was clearly lacking. Uh, instruction in air power history and topics was clearly lacking. Similarly, the RWF, while clearly benefiting from the use of the RAF Staff College at, at Andover, also paradoxically suffered because the history taught at the RAF Staff College fitted the paradigm of the RAF rather than the context of the RWF. While the provision of staff education improved with the emergence towards the end of, end of the Second World War of what would become the RAAF Staff College, problems continued. For example, on his arrival in 1945, the Assistant Commandant Air Commodore J.E. Hewitt was concerned about the, about the lack of in-depth understanding of the history of war displayed by its students. This remained a problem into the 1950s, where lectures on air power remained large, largely based on the British experience. Clearly, while history should be should be studied in width, depth, depth and context, the latter issue of context is also an important issue with regards to your intended audience. If Air Forces wish to develop air-minded officers who can think strategically through the use of history, then the history taught has to be of relevance to that service. Context matters. To conclude, the study of history is of importance to the military professional and the emerging air power strategies. That much is clear. However, its use can be challenging, and it's necessary for anyone wishing to take ownership of their career development to understand those challenges. 
There are also evident, ten evident tensions between the writing of strategy and history. Indeed, it's axiomatic to point out that strategists are not historians. However, they should be mindful of how they use history, while conversely, historians also need to be aware of how the study of the past is used as an educational tool by the military. Some of the uses of history by the military, such as developing corporate spirit, do sit uncomfortably with academics. However, it is arguably a necessary evil. Indeed, as Muller correctly asserted, it must be remembered that these students are military professionals and strategists in training studying military history as part of their professional de de development. They are not aspiring to become practicing military historians. Accepting these inherent tensions, there are several areas where the study of history can play a vital role in the education of air power thinkers in modern air forces, though what I'm about to say is by no means a conclusive list. The first role is that the study of history in width, depth and context provides an essential understanding for military personnel seeking professional mastery of their chosen profession. Indeed, if we accept that the aim of learning is not to provide clear-cut answers to current problems, but rather to develop the cognitive ability to understand and deal with ambiguity, then the study of history has a role to play because the critical thinking skills associated with historical analysis refines areas such as the ability to make considered judgments. An essential contributor to the provision of teaching these critical thinking skills has been the increasing civilianization of academic, um, academic provision at PME institutions over the past 20 years. At a practical level, the use of, use of um, staff rights um, as a didactic tool for experiential learning can also be a means through which history can be used to, as a means to explore ideas outside the confines of the traditional educational environment though they can provide their own challenges. For example, in Australia, um, where does the RWF go in Australia to undertake a staff ride related to air warfare, apart from Darwin? Um, the issues of geography are clearly a limiting point. However, for example, um, back in 2007, I undertook a staff ride with the RAF called Exercise Tally Ho, where we explored a variety of key locations ranging from battle, battle, uh, the, the, the bunker at Uxbridge, the command and control network, through to Dunkirk, Santa Mer, and then through to the Normandy campaign, where staff rides were used as a didactic tool. Finally, and to conclude, as Lieutenant General Sir John Kizeli, former Director General of the Defence Academy in the UK, has remarked, the study of history must form part of a balanced diet of relevant subjects that will help in the education of effective military professionals alongside relevant operational training. And I put a picture of an F1 on it.